relationships, which um, okay. Oh, that's for okay. Uh, we have to understand the issues of power as well as the uses of technology. Now, what we can do and what we must do is to redefine what technology means. We have to define these concepts for our, ourselves. For instance, we can define technology as the tools of Afrocentric development put at the service of Pan-African self-determination. We have to develop an African psychology that is to look at how the minds of our children work so that we can best teach them and work with them, teach them how to think critically, how to ask questions, how to analyze, Educational and training institutions and programs can be set up immediately by us, which teach our children practical skills. And then, of course, we need economic programs so that we can have buildings in which to house these institutions, so that we can have conferences in our own um, major buildings that we have for that. There are so many lectures and lecture series, wonderful ones, that are given throughout this city. I don't know how it is for um, you who come from other cities. Um, but we don't have our own buildings in which those lectures take place. And there are enough of us to get together and have a building. Okay. One of the things that we can all do in terms of education is that we can immediately begin organizing after school programs. Um, organizing schools um, is something that we need to do. That takes more time, takes more resources. After school programs can build towards those and we can do them immediately, right now, when people leave this room. All you have to do is to get together with maybe three or four other people who um, share your commitments and have children. Get those children together and you begin developing a program. That's what we did. And we've had a program now, it's going into its third year. And I would simply like it to be a model for others so that other people can see that, that um, it's very easy to do. All it takes is commitment. And then through all of this, we need to develop some, some standardized um, uh, curricula material that can be uh, dispersed throughout the African uh, community in this nation and throughout the world. And there, again, are enough of us doing this kind of work that, that we can uh, think in terms of um, standardizing things and getting them in record form. Uh, finally, we need to pull these two aspects together, the practical and uh, the spiritual, the esoteric and the exoteric. Um, both are extremely important. Um, but we cannot have one without the other. The esoteric, spiritual, and the holistic must go hand in hand with the exoteric, the practical, and what has been called the academic in, um, in European culture. Um, for us, the base will always have to be the sacred, will always have to be the spiritual, because it is from there um, that we get meaning, and that we get our commitments to, and our values. And it is from there that we get our direction. Um, so this is something that I think we can both learn from African civilization and that we can just use and begin to build. Thank you very much.
Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a pleasure to in be invited to sort of uh, speak with you today. I <clears throat> want, uh, again, to take up much of your time. I want to pretend to be an expert on uh, Egyptian education <laughs> and uh, now Valley education since my interest is more contemporary. So I'll just sort of briefly outline some of the information I've been able to glean about the, the education of the Egyptian boy in particular. One of the things though that I found out about Egyptian education and the, is the fact that certainly education was highly revered among the Egyptians and the learned person was a highly revered and respected individual. Learning then had a major place, a, a central place in Egyptian life. So where and whenever you uh, come upon Egyptian literature, you find an enthusiastic reference for learning. And many of the journals and diaries of various persons uh, during this period of time refer to education. One such as a nobleman who was carrying his son to a school on the Nile who admonished him to give thy heart to learning and love her like a mother. For there is nothing that is so precious as learning. When we look at uh, Egyptian education, we see that the education began very early in the life of children. The boys began their education uh, at around age four. And uh, that education continued for about 10 to 12 years. So essentially you had what we would consider today an adolescent uh, at age 14, 15, and 16 ready to enter into full adult life and to undertake adult responsibilities in terms of his uh, past learning. The arts of reading and writing and knowledge of books was recognized by all classes of Egyptians. And as we might expect, the king's children and the children of the official classes were educated at the court schools even though education also took place at the temples. And at a later point in Egyptian life, they took place at, uh, under various governmental agencies and departments. Because of course we must recognize that Egyptian society was a very complex one, and therefore education took place in many areas of Egyptian life, some of it being more specified than others. The high officials of the government were in part responsible for the education of the youngsters as well as, of course, the priests and others we would expect to be involved in education. You had a type of corporate education as well where the, the young man was educated by an official who ran a particular department but also was a worker for that official. So you, you got sort of a double type of education, a type of cooperative education, where the student learned a, the formal um, curriculum, but also learned by doing. It was involved in the practical workings of the system and of the department under which he was being educated. The education also took place under what we call the schoolmaster. And this education was very strict and severe. In fact, it's a type of education that many of us have come to repudiate <laughs> to a certain degree because corporal punishment was not forbidden and was used quite uh, liberally. The uh, student sat at the master's feet and the schoolmaster had what we call today virtually absolute power and authority when dealing with the student. The student began school very early in the morning and worked until noonday or for long hours. The penalty for not paying attention, the penalties for being lazy were quite severe 
And you can, in looking at some of the proverbs, you can recognize that the, many of these schoolmasters did not hesitate to execute discipline. One of the standard statements was, a boy's ears are in his backside, and he listens or obeys when he is beaten. But of course, um, another uh, major part of the discipline of disciplining of the boy was not merely that of corporal punishment, but that of what we call admonishments, proverbs, where the student was constantly admonished with proverbs and sayings uh, to, of course, do his best to strive for excellence. And so in the review of various schools' materials, you will see those materials filled with proverb after proverb, warning after warning, and other kinds of statements seeking to motivate the student highly to achieve perfection. Education was not something merely given to the noble uh, people or the sons of noble people, but also people of what we may call the lower classes, who many of whom went to school with the sons of princes. So there was a mixing of classes, particularly in the school for scribes. So then we can see an interest in the basic uh, elements of, of education, reading, writing, and so forth, going down not only in terms of the noble classes, but in terms of the working classes themselves. In terms of what was learned, we pretty much see in general outline that what was learned during the educational period of the Egyptian boy was pretty much what's being learned today, reading, writing, and arithmetic to a good extent. A great deal of emphasis was put on the learning of the hieroglyphics, and a great deal of emphasis was put on copying materials, copying from books, and of course copying the uh, proverbs and saying of elders and revered ancients. A good deal of emphasis was put on, of course, words and vocabulary. The attitudes of the boys were um, stimulated as well, particularly in terms of being industrious and active. Much of the material that the student copied was material from his own schoolmaster, and much of that material was material that was written in the form of advice, in forms of rebukes and ex exhortations to work toward excellence and to work with all their might. There was a very high reverence for words among the Egyptians, and of course the student was taught to revere words. In fact, the words were often referred to as divine words. The, the words were seen as the invention of the god Toth, who was very much the patron god of writing, period. This revering of the word, of course, we see present in African cultures after Egypt right on down to the present day. I was sort of um, impressed to see reference made to the word in Mantu, as I believe it was John who talked about the word and its importance to African culture and society. All magic, he states, is word magic, incantation and ex exorcism blessing and curse. Through nomo, that is the word, man establishes his mastery over things. Everything comes into being through the word. And of course, we are reminded of this in the familiar testament that reads, first there was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And of course, we are reminded of the creation story, which sees creation taking place in terms of the word. This idea then of the word as a creative force, as a transforming force, has been a part of African culture up to the present day. The word, John says, itself is force. The word holds the course of things and train and changes and transforms them. No more the word creates images upon images and transforms them. 
in what I think is a very remarkable book, The Pedagogy of the Oppress, we see again Paulo Freire talking about the word in one instance stating, to speak a true word is to transform the world. And of course we see in the teachings of Jesus the statement again about words and about truth. And the truth being that which frees men from bondage. Freire says to exist humanly is to name the world, to change the world. Beside the study of words, of course, was the study of math, the study of geometry, because, of course, as we're all familiar with, this was very necessary for the building of Egyptian society, for the measuring of land, and various other types of activities that were very necessary to the functioning of Egyptian society. Let's look for a moment, briefly, at um, what this education was used for. I don't want to leave you with the impression, of course, that Egyptian education was narrow. It was quite broad. That education include, even, included even uh, gymnastics, and of course the teaching of ethics, and uh, Professor Richards has, has uh, alluded to the fact that the idea of spirit, the idea of ethics and conducts is at the very center of African education, and we see that at the very center of Egyptian education. Practical philosophy was also a part of the education of the Egyptian child. That is, philosophy not just in its um, abstract sense, but philosophy in terms of conducting oneself. The Egyptians, of course, held uh, in high esteem the ability of the individual to behave mannerably, to behave justly. And this was considered then just as much a part of education as an education in, in hieroglyphics and other aspects of language and literature as well as mathematics. Good manners and conducts was a major part of education. Of course you had the education of the soldiers, the education of the painters, of the sculptors, the various other craftsmen, and uh, the various other professions uh, as well. The education of the Egyptian was used pretty much in a sense the way education is used today to carry out very functional jobs and activities in the society itself. Of course the kings and nobles and the, the elite classes owned very large tracts of land and they had uh, chronic need for scribes for people who could mathematically uh, register their crops, who could uh, perform the necessary mental, academic, and other kinds of work to see that the harvest and other activities were performed efficiently. The priesthood class was also a class of very large landowners and required large numbers of scribes and other scholars as well scribes to keep the accounts of things going on in the, in the temple, to copy the re religious texts, of course, because now, of course, we, we, it amazes me today when I look at uh, how we use copiers, and you begin to think, how is it that people made it without these things we call copiers today? And you recognize that there had to be an awful lot of writing and copying in order for uh, knowledge to be disseminated. So consequently, of course, the work for the scribes was plentiful in the copying of texts and, of course, writing for people, translating for people, in keeping the registers of religious um, offerings to the gods, for drafting inscriptions on the temples which were to be painted. So a great deal was to be accomplished by education and, of course, in terms of sculpting, in terms of painting, in terms of building, architecture, engineering, and all of the things we uh, admired the Egyptian society for had to be, of course, supported by an educational system. The education of the scribe was, of course, highly valued, probably above all others, or at least uh, 
um, uh, equal to many other uh, levels and forms of education. It had some very practical aspects to it. Some of the practical aspects, of course, are the kind of aspects we see today. To become a scribe was to move into a whole new class, was to gain immense status, was also to move into an area of employment in which there was little or no unemployment. It was a, a chance to be employed by the, the kings and queens and nobles and what other, other groups uh, were responsible for the functioning of the society as a whole. It gave a man a chance perhaps to lead the armies, to become a diplomat, an ambassador, to be a special envoy of the king, maybe to be a major potentate within the king's court. He meant that he was highly respected by others and carried a great deal of authority. So you can see why many Egyptians, both uh, lower, so-called lower class as well as higher class, aspired to getting their sons to follow this profession. I want to look for a moment then at possibly what we can learn from the study of Egyptian education. As we already have seen, there are some parallels in Egyptian education uh, with education as it's carried out today. And there are some things about Egyptian education which we need uh, to revive. Certainly the love for knowledge is something that we find in Egyptian education that can be stimulated far more than it is today. I'm constantly surprised sometimes in my classes when I become ecstatic about learning and how sometimes my students are looking at me as if I'm freaking out. <laughs> and uh, in fact, about two or three weeks ago, the New York Times had an article that related concentration to euphoria. Uh, and, and the idea being that learning at times can be a euphoric uh, experience. In fact, I've often compared it to a climactic experience, something which has somewhat of a sexual nature about it. You see this kind of ecstasy in learning in children very early in life. Because, ladies and gentlemen, ultimately the human being adjusts to his or her culture through learning. The brain itself is a learning machine. It comes to the world not organized like that of an animal and not pre-wired like that of instinctual beings, but it comes made programmable so that it can aid in the adaptation of the human being to various environments and various cultures and various situations. It is an instrument, the brain is, that is designed to, after it gets certain information, to coordinate that information and to perform creative acts on that information and therefore influence its environment and adapt the environment to its own needs. Generally then what we have, we can say then that learning of course obviously is a necessary human activity. And generally those necessary human activities, those activities that are necessary for sustaining the life and the survival of human beings are often attended with pleasure in their functioning. You could uh, imagine what would happen to us if sex was painful. <laughs> so in the service of life, sex is indeed a very pleasurable activity. In the service of survival, then learning too should be indeed an ecstatic and pleasurable activity. And we see that in children as they dot and dash through the environment early in life and they are so curious and they are exploring and investigating and they are startled and awed by the various things that the environment have to offer. And it is somewhat pathetic though to see as they move into their later years of childhood, 
they begin to associate learning with anxiety, with fear. And uh, later on, you can see them even beginning to wear dumbness and stupidness as a badge of honor. When they gain status from their peers by demonstrating their ignorance. So you know then, for learning to be unpleasurable, there must have been at some point during the life of the human being when it was twisted and distorted by misguided adults and others who influenced the child. Hopefully then we can resurrect this love of learning among ourselves. The love of words, which was, as I stated, very high among the Egyptians, I certainly hope would be restored to us today as Africans. As we said earlier, first there was the Word, and the Word was God, the Word was with God, and we see God creating the world in terms of the Word and the image and the symbol. We are in this building today, and we must know that the first act of the creation of this building was the bringing forth of an image in somebody's mind, a thought, an idea, followed again by a whole set of words and negotiations, and again by a whole set of figures and symbols on paper. And then it was out of this use of words and symbols that we have this organized structure that we're in today. No buildings that we see are the result of random activity. They are the result of the use of the word and of imaging. And for a people to build and construct and to transform the world and to transform the society, for a people to transform themselves, they must have the word. One of the major problems with the African today is that he has no control of the word. We are complaining today about the fact that the word has been put into the hands of another people. And those words being put into the hands of another people have been used to destroy our self-image, our self-confidence, have been used to destroy our mind, have been used as vehicle in which to introject the inferiority complex into our very personalities today. We will not gain control of ourselves nor control of the world until we gain control of the word and the control of the image. The word is divine, the word is magic, and we will not be able to perform that magic until the word becomes ours again. One of the major functions of the black professional is to gain control of the word and to gain control of definition. One of the things that, have noted, that I've noted as being one of the constants that has remained with us since we've dealt with the European, no matter how many changes we've gone through, no matter what you say about integrated living and all of this other stuff we call progress today, is that the European has not relinquished his control of the word and has not relinquished his control of information. The control of information is the first step that one must achieve when one wants to brainwash another and wants to create the mind of another. The words that a parent says to a child helps to create the personality of that child. The absence of words also create personality as well. And consequently, when we talk about education today, both with this presence of words and this negative words and with this absence of uh, positive words, we see then in this control of words, the control of the African mind. Of course, the other thing we can note in terms of Egyptian education is the emphasis on discipline. Maybe we would have some uh, problems with uh, corporal punishment as a form of discipline. However, the idea that there must exist some discipline is one that we must endorse. When I go to schools, the first thing I'm struck with as I visit schools, particularly in the city of New York, is the absence of discipline, is a sense of disorder and a sense of chaos. Even when I enter into the classroom of teachers, 
I still get this sense. We as Africans will have to study the relationship between discipline and learning. I think we've been put into a major trick. It's interesting to note that the Europeans literally beat their children into the middle class. And then once they beat them into the middle class and created a tradition around them, corporal punishment became unlawful. And now it is scientific to approach them in various other ways. However, we as a people must recognize that in terms of our own development, we, are not, we do not occupy the exact historical situation, economic and social situation of the European. And consequently, their methods for disciplining their children may not be appropriate to the methods we may need to use in order to move our own people forward. We must not be then, we must not be then deceived by these people who choose to ignore their history and to present now their methods of disciplining their children as being scientific, as being the latest in uh, psychological research and discovery. We must recognize them for what they are. They represent a historical process of a people now who, who have gone through an evolutionary phase in the educating of their children to the point now where other methods of disciplining and control may be used. Therefore, we have to look at the disciplining of our children in terms of the reality of the African in the world today and in terms of what we are trying to achieve. Uh, Professor Richardson mentioned uh, apprenticeship, which we see, of course, uh, plenty of in the Egyptian educational system. And coincidentally, for the last couple of days, I've also been thinking along those lines of the need for more of us as professionals to take under our wings protégés and others and to see to their training and development because we cannot leave the whole of the training of our scholars, of our uh, intellectuals, and of other people, and, and of others, to the European. Obviously, as Dr. Clark has indicated, the European is not going to move us toward liberation education. In European education, in, in Egyptian education, we see a reverence for history. We, of course, have mentioned a reverence for ethics and for spirit. This is very, very, very important. I think this is one of the key things that will distinguish an Afrocentric education from that of a Eurocentric education. That is the including into the education a, of a spiritual component, of an ethical component. As I've said on many occasions, the educated individual today is the most dangerous individual on earth. Educated human beings today, ladies and gentlemen, are twisted and distorted. And they represent the greatest danger to life on earth. How do I say that? When this world ends, and if it ends, it will not be brought to an end by muggers, by rapists, by robbers, by dropouts. It will be brought to an end by PhDs. It will be brought to an end by people who have clipped lawns and little lovely kids and two-car garages. It will be brought to an end by the pillars of society who go to church, who vote, who are concerned with the Board of Education, but who will also go to work and design bombs and design all kinds of offensive and defensive weapons, who are doctors who will design germ warfare, botanists who will design biological warfare to, to destroy crops, psychologists who will design methods of destroying people's minds and so forth, sociologists who will determine how you can destroy a society and its values, 
So the thing that we must recognize that education in a Eurocentric society is an education for war. And every discipline is a part of that war effort. Every discipline is a part of its, its scheme to dominate other people. The African American student is often deceived by this type of thing. They're deceived into thinking that the education they're receiving is non-political, which is the most political thing of all. All disciplines are related in some way to politics, and all disciplines are in some way related to maintaining the dominance of Eurocentric society. The Eurocentric society is one that is based on death and, and domination. And those people who are educated in it are educated to bring death and domination upon other people. <laughs> Therefore, the educated individual who feels he's educated and his education gives him a right to rob and steal from the average man and the lesser educated man, and he thinks by spending 10 or 20 years in school, he's justified in robbing the people of every last dime they have. And, and, and so therefore, you can see even our uh, medical doctors and so forth often then have in them still that germ of rape and robbery that is a part of Eurocentric education. The education is very subtle. I told my class the other day, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it really be so different if you came to this class out of a desire to learn, you know, just out of the pure desire to learn, and that we didn't relate to each other as student and teacher, but as people sharing knowledge and information, and that I didn't have to, I don't have to take the role of an authority over you, and that I don't have to motivate your education through fear. So that you do what you are asked to do because you're afraid of getting an F. Or because you want to get an A. Or because you want to be great one day. Or because you want status and all of these other things. Can't you see then at the very center of your education is an education based on fear and false pride and false motivations so that when you get through you will be a twisted human being and therefore you will interject that kind of value upon the population as a whole. So this is why we have the paradox of the educated European not becoming civilized but more uncivilized and how ultimately knowledge will become the source of man's destruction. One of the fundamental orientation then of an Afrocentric education is to change this orientation, this fundamental death and rapacious motivation at the root of education. And one of the ways of doing this, of course, is to reintroject the spirit, the ethics, and to reintroject in some way religion, and reverence for life in education. People who are educated without spirit, without a reference for life, are educated to become prostitutes. They then will sell their services to the highest bidders, regardless of how what they will do will be used. And so we have the stupid situation that we are faced with today of where by offering a physicist a corner house and a two car, gar car garage and a full professorship, he will make a bomb that will destroy himself, his children and grandchildren and the whole of the world. When we are blown up one day, we would recognize the superiority of those societies we've been trained to look down upon today. So consequently then, the African education is one that must be fundamentally redirected. Let's look again then at some of the differences, and I will wrap it up shortly. In, in, I don't think we gain a great deal if we are narrow in looking at uh, African education and Egyptian education. 
if we assume that all we have to do is just reimpose it upon ourselves, because we have to face a reality. We do live in a different historical time and a different political, social, contextual time. And that, of course, has to be uh, considered when we look at education. We have to recognize that the Egyptian was educated within a nation, within an empire. And of course, it means then that even when the Egyptian was educated in a very practical sense of saying, okay, you get educated this way and you, you will uh, become a scribe and you will become respected by men and so forth and so on, you will make big money and this and so forth, you have to recognize that we quite, can't quite motivate our own children in this light. You see, the most practical motivation in education is this, go to school so you can get a job. Go to school so you, you, know, you can uh, be employed and gain status and so forth. But you must recognize when you own your own nation, this is compatible with advancing the interests of that nation. But when you are in the midst of another nation, and when you are a dominated people, to advise and motivate your children on that basis means that they have a narrow concept of education and in following through their professions, they will support directly and indirectly the very system which dominates them. So, so, so we have to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that it is not enough just to educate our children in reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I think even those of us who call ourselves Afrocentric have forgotten about that. We think that it is enough merely to train our children in Afrocentric thoughts and orientations. However, to train them in Afrocentric thoughts and orientation and mathematics and science without also preparing a nation for them is filled with problems. And often it means then that you will educate a very, maybe a very brilliant mathematician who has Afrocentric ideas, but who in the end still must work for IBM and AT&T and the rest. And he'll find himself frustrated and upset, but in order to earn his bread, he's got to work for the enemy. So consequently then, a part of education, ladies and gentlemen, is the building of a nation and the building of institutions so that we can hire those ones we educate. So, so that in working to fulfill their own uh, needs and desires, even though those needs may be somewhat selfish, they are still working to advance the interests of the nation. You can educate your children into scientific thinking and mathematical thinking all you wish. Unless you have an economy, it will come to nothing. Because today, ladies and gentlemen, doing a, an advanced project, in, in a research project in physics, costs millions and millions of dollars. If you're going to build a cyclotron, for instance, you may have to build that cyclotron filled with heavy magnets and heavy uses of electricity for five or six or 12 miles around. This requires tremendous investments of money and time. Consequently, it means if the African society is to advance to any great degree, the African society must develop its economy so that it can support scientific and other forms of research. Otherwise, we are just sort of uh, at, uh, making pipe dreams. We must recognize, too, that the Egyptian is being educated under the influence of autonomy. That is, Egypt is an autonomous nation and an empire. We must recognize today, though, that our education takes place under domination. And this, I think, uh, means a fundamental difference in direction of education of the current African is against the Egyptian. To a good extent, a great deal of Egyptian education was conservative, maintaining a great and glorious nation and history and past. 
as well, of course, as maintaining their survival. But in our situation, ladies and gentlemen, we are not dealing in an, in an autonomous con context. We are operating in a context of domination, which means I think that our, th our fundamental thrust, or at least the fundamental thrust of African education today should be revolutionary. It should be an education geared toward the overthrow of those people who dominate us. While it will contain certain conservative elements and it will search, seek to conserve those things in African history and in the African experience that are dear to us and that are important to us and that are at the very center of our personality and culture. And while it must, al it must also uh, rebuild a culture, it must rebuild a tradition and build new traditions as well. The ultimate thing then is that our education has to be one that doesn't just close our mind into tradition, but one that opens our minds up, builds in a flexibility so that we can deal with the wily and clever enemies that we have before us today. So consequently then, the education of the African-American is one that must be very closely tied to African tradition, but also to the current African reality and to the African future that we wish to make. We must recognize, too, that African education today has to be, to a large part, therapeutic. The African mind has been made ill by its experience with the European. It is sick and it is near the point of madness, and it has to be restored. The, the African mind today, and I'm speaking of the world over, to a great extent is a mind still dominated by the servant mentality. We don't have time to go into the ramifications of that mentality, except that it is a mentality that is designed to maintain us in servitude and designed not to ensure our survival in the future. One of the things that you must recognize very clearly is that in order for oppression to work as it does today, we have to literally be robbed of our brain and of the use of our brain power. One of the major things that we have to be robbed of is our ability to think and to think critically. I hold that ability above almost all the others. In fact, to create almost a sacrilege, I hold it as high as the knowledge of Afrocentric history. Because to me, a people who have a free mind and a critical mind will by their very use of logic come to know the value of being Afrocentric. We don't want our people to learn to be Afrocentric by the way of jingoisms and by the way of tight traditions. We want them to arrive at their Afrocentrism through the use of their free and great African minds. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to say that Professor Wilson is a community person who lives and functions in a, an institute part of his design in addition to hostess, and that he's very much a part of us and what he has been saying to you this morning is the same thing he's been saying to us in the community, weekly and sometimes daily, all along. I want to deal very briefly with what Professor Richard said 
then Professor Wilson, then we're gonna to go to questions, uh, and we're not gonna have that much time, then we will, wait, we will vacate for the next panel. Professor Richard dealt principally with custom and culture and attitudes that grow out of custom and culture. And what we have lost in the Western world, we have lost the means of custom and culture. And let me show you what I mean. Now, we maintain through memory so much that was African in us. And I had to go to Africa to understand this. There was a, there was a custom in the South after a death that the family, someone comes from the community and the ladies help to take everything out of the house and clean the house. That custom was consistent even to the point where there was a stale old joke when someone comes into a house that's in disarray. They said, why don't somebody die in this house so the community can come and clean it up? <laughs> All right, no. When I went to Africa, <laughs> <laughs> now when I went to Africa, I saw the other part of that way, the part that we had forgotten. I saw when the deceased, the widow of the deceased, begins to cry, and she never cries until the official announcement is made of her husband's death, no matter how much she feels, until the elder of the family have announced the death, he is not officially dead, although she knows physically he's dead. He's dead to the group when the elder says he's dead and announced that our brother has departed. And every time she wept, women of her age group came around her and they comfort her. That throughout that society there was someone to comfort you at every level. And when we danced out, and I say we because I got into the dance, out the, the life of the deceased, everybody there had to dance out his relationship to this disease. And when it came almost my time to dance, I almost panicked. <laughs> I'd never done a dance in an African ring in my life. And I asked an African girl, how do you do this dance? Where do you put your feet? And she looked me straight in the eye and said, Mr. Clark, you have no feet. The African dance has nothing to do with the feet. It has to do with the soul. If you can feel your relationship with this man, then you can dance out that relationship. If it touches your heart, your, what you call your feet will take care of itself. <laughs> Once I could understand how I related to the deceased, the morning meetings we had, he was a bus driver. How he always brought his son to the morning meetings to hear me speak English. Didn't know that my English is less than perfect. And how we saw him to the door of the family compound as he went over, went to in town to drive the buses. And how we read the evening papers and the morning papers together and discussed the affairs of the world. Once I knew and felt my relationship to the deceased, I got in, in the dance ring and did something well I'd never done in my life. I danced exceptionally well. <laughs> now the important thing is that once the widow comes back, there's a ceremony when the whole community gives her the assurance that the community is going to take care of her. And when the men give her new shoes and they're singing, as long as there's shoes among your people, you'll have shoes. The women have disposed of all the clothes she wore when her husband 
was alive. In symbol of the new life, the women have made her a new wardrobe. And the women are singing, as long as there's clothes among your people, you'll have clothes. Then they make a big banquet. And she is to taste all of the food before anyone else eats while they're singing. As long as there's food among your people, you'll have food. Then I said, these are the people here in the slums of Accra, who's supposed, in the Ghana, who's supposed to be primitive. This is civilization. This is social security built into a culture. This is high culture. And this is what I mean by the preservation of custom in culture. And this is the first thing the European tries to take away from you. He laughs at your gods. Then he teaches you to laugh at your gods. Then he does not have to build massive prisoners because once you laugh at your gods and turn your back on the culture that produced you, you are a prisoner, you are a slave. So education must be an education for restorations. Both Professor Wilson and Professor Richard dealt with symbols. And so long as we are not in control of symbols, it was the search for symbols that led me into the field of history, looking in the Sunday school lesson and not finding my people at all. Even in Africa, I couldn't find them. I see people going to the land of Pont, that's present day, Somaliland, and they got white. I see an African named Moses going down to Ethiopia where he marries Zipporah. Zipporah got white and he got white. The Bible gives him one Ethiopian wife, my research gives him three. Let us say that he developed a taste for chocolate very early. But once you understand the nature of symbols and what it's supposed to do with your mind, once you begin to deal with the education and the restoration of images of yourself, then you're on your way. Then, then you will have to deal with the prevailing symbol. You will have to get rid of the blonde, blue-eyed Jesus in your churches. Until you do that, you will not give the Father the proper respect. And you will not know what we were doing at different parts, at different times in our history. Now, if you look at the time span of the color purple and look at the true history of black people, we were doing a whole lot of things. We were moving out of the South. We were resettling the whole march from Kansas. And once the Kansas River overflowed and Kansas got too bad, they marched out of Kansas and someone walked into Oklahoma. It was a period of Pap Singleton and his group. It was a period of early Pan-Africanism. We're doing a whole lot of things other than, and there may have been someone engaged in incest, but remember throughout our told history, incest has been an act punishable by death. Yes. And two of the best known novels written by blacks, Invisible Man begins with incest, and The Color Purple begins with incest because they are programmed by someone else to pick out images within whites and fasten them on us. Until you would deal with images and symbols, you won't deal with yourself. And you can begin with a mirror and until you walk away from that mirror and say, I like what I see, you will not start to deal with images. <laughs> the 
Professor Jeffries has an announcement. Then we'll go into the questions. Hotep, brothers and sisters. Okay. Certainly a beautiful thing to see all of you here at this uh, institution. This is one of those institutions that uh, Professor Wilson was talking about. <laughs> if you have a degree from one of these institutions, like Columbia University and the rest, you got, you're in trouble. <laughs> and if you're teaching there, you're in trouble. A whole lot of things. We'll go into that as we get into the conference. We do want to go into some bookkeeping and other things that we have to uh, make sure we take care of, um, and mechanics. I don't want to lose the flow of the, of the panel. Um, we will finish this panel and move right into the next panel with a short break in between. Then we will have a break for dinner. Um, there are restaurants in the neighborhood that are available. There will be food vendors that are available. Um, we wish you to come back in the, uh, not straight too far, they have Reliables, Copelands, Wilsons within easy distance. Come back for the presidential address and also the activities after that in which Professor Clark will be featured. So that uh, gear yourself in terms of your time um, because this is a special happening and um, a special occasion. Yeah. Okay. We will have a other announcements about the bus leaving, going back to the Penta, so people can prepare to uh, come back uh, this evening. We'll make those announcements later. Uh, a couple of our panelists were not able uh, to attend uh, because of health and other reasons. And, uh, but I'm sure that we all had a fantastic presentation with the brothers and sisters that we have today. Could we give them a special round of applause? We've described the question and answer period as the African community response. So we expect to hear from you, John. I don't have to repeat Dr. Ben's instructions about a question, supposed to be a question and not a dissertation. Someone down there will have to recognize the hands for me because in this glare, I may not be able to see the hands very well. Let's come straight to the questions, make them short and right. And let's start right now. And we have approximately 10 minutes, maybe a little less, from we have to vacate for the next panel and the brief break before the new panel. Professor Wilson, you can address your question to Professor Wilson or myself because the panel consists of practically two right now except Professor Jeffers who's administratively moving around taking care of business. Yes.
As a matter of fact, it, uh, the media are a central institution for the creation of the Afrocentric personality. It is a major means, as I mentioned earlier, by which you begin to brainwash people, and that is by controlling information and the nature of information and the interpretation of that information. And so it is obvious that the information that we see in the media, whether it's cartoons, uh, soap operas, or what have you, ultimately are going to be presented in such a way as to maintain the status quo, that is, the power relationship between our people. It becomes very interesting to note that how many a scientist today relates his scientific interest and development to the reading of comic books. Of course, I've on other occasions urged that the black community develops a science fiction, so-called a science fiction genre as a form of writing, because it is very, very important. The, the science fiction of today becomes the, the reality of tomorrow. The science fiction that stimulates the fantasies today becomes, of course, the science concrete uh, existence, the, the concrete reality of tomorrow. When you look at these comic books and these other things and do not see yourself, obviously then the fantasies are not being stimulated, the imagination is not being stimulated, and in a sense, as the statement goes, what we cannot conceive, we really cannot produce, we cannot create. If we do not dream of ourselves as being masters of the universe, then that will not come as a reality to us. And these dreams begin in cartoons, in fairy tales, and in other uh, materials that are fed to children. It's interesting to note, when you look at cartoons, for instance, Masters of the Universe, of course, the very name itself, Masters, and that it, it suggests itself. And then there is the association of the Masters with the white skin, or the Masters with uh, machinery the Transformers with machinery. Hero, of course, being a white man. Shira, being a white woman, and so forth. So you get this constant association of mastery with whiteness. You also, and even though you get an association between good and bad, generally those people who are going to master the world, whether good or bad, are whites in one way or the others. Of course, the black characters, if they're included at all, are included as secondary characters and achieve their power through the delegation of their power from their white masters. It's often uh, interesting to note that even when you have so-called cartoons that, it, that include uh, black characters, they are quite often jokes. I think they have one plastic man, you see the spaceship with the big lips, and uh, it's just a ridiculous type of uh, the, because even though it's so-called a space show, you, it's quite obvious that it is a joke immediately. Running throughout these cartoons on Saturday mornings is the theme of power. And through, and so consequently, and of course running throughout comic books is the theme of power. And the whole struggle is usually over who is going to rule the world. The bad guys or the good guys. But whether they are good or bad, they both are struggling for power. So by the time our children get through reading these comics and looking at these cartoons and looking at the various other things that occur on TV, their mentality has been one that is fitted for servitude. Next question. For the next question, uh, if you can hear me, for the next question, look at the symbol on TV. Why is the black character in different strokes a rump? And why is the one in Webster a rump? They never wish to show you full grown or full blown. And this is 
something else we have to fully deal with. All right, next question, please. Evaluating it, 
looking at its logical consequences and conclusions. You must be put in a state of mind where you accept what is said on the basis of authority, on the basis of the authority of the speaker. So then the paternalistic relationship which adheres in colonialistic organization, the paternalistic relationship that uh, was present on the plantation, the, plant, the paternalistic relationship that is present today in the world is the relationship that creates the white man as the authority, as the arbiter of truth, as the source of knowledge, and consequently then it reduces our ability to critically look at what he has to say. We accept what he has to say on, on, uh, on his authority without thought and we act upon it. And of course we act upon it in his interest. The world in no way, and this includes not only the black world, but also the white world, in no way could be the way it is if even 20% of the people in it could think critically. It is dependent on lies and on the belief of those lies, even lies like private property. The concept of private property, which we won't go into today, but a very interesting kind of lie. The lower class in believing the upper class supports that upper class because they are robbed of their critical skills. I'll, I'll end it here, even though I could talk quite a bit about this. No, thanks. Stop here. <laughs> Our time is about running out. We're going to take two more questions, and we are obliged to, to, to stop. I would like to talk all evening the same as you, and I would like to listen, too. Yes, ma'am. Speak a little louder, please. Well, of course, uh, I want I want you to write a prescription for the revolution. Okay, of course, because one part about revolution is that revolution and the goal of revolution should be something, as Ferris says too, that is derived from dialogue, from the people dialoguing with each other from an analysis of reality, an analysis of our situation, and then working that through. And one of the things uh, he notes, which I subscribe to, is that we have to be very careful, those of us who are in so-called positions of leadership or influence, whatever you want to call it, in the way we relate to our people, in that we don't want to come with them with prescriptions already laid out because in a sense through this kind of approach we tend to bring on the kind of approach that already exists as a part of the master-slave relationship and of course by using this approach we have to maintain the passivity of the people and if we're talking about then critical thinking the people themselves must be critically involved in determining the goals of revolution. So the thing that I'm getting at then is this, that the revolution and the goals of the revolution will be whatever African people, after an objective, Afrocentric determination and cultural analysis, will determine that they will be. The, the major thing, I think, uh, in terms of the immediate situation is to strive for, as I've urged earlier, the teaching of that child to, of course, to perceive the world clearly and realistically, and to give it the abilities and the skills by which it can perform a realistic analysis 
of that world and, and, and oriented toward basic its activities and behavior on reality itself, which of course then involves what we call these cognitive skills uh, training, the reasoning skills training, the very basic ones, the, of course, the use of the word itself, mm -hmm. sharpening its observational abilities and its abilities to, to uh, project in terms of planning and organizing and its ability to see relations between causes and effects. And of course, in relationship to that, uh, a history and a knowledge of itself, its people, and its culture. And I think with this basic arming of the child, it will then, of course, arrive at the kinds of behaviors and knowledge that will secure its survival and its coping in the current world today. I'd like to say that because we misunderstand the word revolution, we even think the American Revolution was a revolution and it was not. We think the Re French Revolution was a revolution and it was not. We've got to first understand what a revolution means. It means complete change. And we cannot have a revolution imitating other people. The Africans, when in charge of their own destiny, had many revolutions. He sat down and realized that certain aspects of the society had grown obsolete and had to be changed. And he intelligently changed it and he changed most of them without drawing a drop of blood. The European has never been as peaceful and as intelligent enough to make great social changes without declaring war on other people. We cannot have revolution imitating the European because he is not revolutionary. <laughs> we'll, have the, we'll have the last question, and I purposely tried to avoid mentioning cause something or another, because you have two kinds of Marxists among blacks. You have the Groucho Marxists and the Karl Marxists. <laughs> and I'm always running into the Grouchos, <laughs> and I'm trying to avoid that today. We'll take the last question, please. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, psychogenic brain damage? Yes, the, the simple idea is that you can accomplish through the use of the word, as we mentioned, through, through conditioning, through oppression and the other kinds of things we are very familiar with as people. The same results in creating a mental state and behavior as you would through the deliberate physical uh, destruction of the brain itself. In other words, we can disorganize the brain physically uh, through use of drugs, through, of course, through uh, ex excising with the, with the surgical knife, through various other physical means, and of course, you can create various behaviors and wipe out various abilities through this physical means. What we're indicating and what must be made clear is that the same kinds of things you accomplish through physical means can be accomplished through psychological means as well. For instance, uh, you can control intractable pain or you can control some forms, at least as it's been tried anyway, to control some forms of schizophrenia and schizophrenic behavior and other forms of behavior by performing what we call a lombotomy. Lobotomy, that is the cutting off of the frontal lobes from the other part of the brain. One of the problems with that, besides the fact that the operation often does not work that very well, is the fact that uh, there are other side effects, such as reduced motivation on the part of the patient, such as easy distractibility on the part of the patient, such as the inability to maintain attention, the inability to achieve certain goals, uh, a certain um, 
lack of the appropriate emotional response on the part of the patient. It's also interesting to note that the frontal lobes are the, that aspect of the brain that uses the word, that uses images to organize the rest of the brain and to actually program the body to achieve certain goals. So when a command is given to the frontal lobes, the frontal lobes translate to that command into body behavior, into attentional behavior, into setting goals, into testing behavior, so that once the goal is set, the frontal lobe programs the eyes and the senses to be sensitive to various things that are necessary to the accomplishing of that goal, calling up previous information and correlating as such. It maintains focus so that things that are irrelevant to the achievement of the goal uh, are, are not attended to. And all of this is accomplished by the use of words and symbols and experience in the frontal lobes. So consequently then, people without words, without certain words, without certain symbols, without certain experiences, or with certain words and experiences, you see, the, uh, and when those, symbol, those experiences are used by the brain, are made capable or incapable of certain forms of behavior. So to deny certain people words, concepts, and images, and experiences, to interject into those frontal lobes senses of inferiority, lack of self-confidence, self-hatred, and other kinds of things, is to literally then to perform a lobotomy on the individual. So consequently, you will find many of our people as a result of these psycho this psychological lobotomy having the symptoms of a psychosurgical patient the inability to maintain goals and senses of direction, the inability to, to determine what is relevant from the irrelevant, the inability to correlate necessary information uh, to achievement of a goal, the inability to completely program the body and behavior in line with the goal, the inability to check against reality the behavior and see if it is behavior that is accomplishing the end sought by the person. Of course, then the rewriting of history by the European, the, the scandalization of the African personality, the introduction into the African of self-doubt about his abilities, the whole system of paternalism which takes away from the African the responsibility for his future is a part of this psychological psychosurgery. And it is then a way of robbing and this, the African brain of its necessary programs to achieve African survival and independence. It is a way then of literally cutting up our brains without physically entering into our skulls. Thank you very much. Thank you, brothers and sisters. There'll be a short break before the next question. Very short, I think because we've used up more than enough of our time. All right, uh, prepare to come right back for another panel and partake of these fruits of education. Thank you very much again. appropriate that I be asked to chair the very last panel because I live so far away in Seattle, Washington. And, <laughs> and we decided on this particular panel not to hurry. Uh, we've prepared for this panel, which we feel is so significant, speaking about the African family, the Nile, and we have some very, very, very important messages to share with you. I would like to introduce the members of the panel, Sister Clark, <laughs> who many, many of us have shared a number of experiences with for the last three years in Los Angeles and in Chicago, and Sister Gordon, and Sister Jeannie Bain. I'm asking us if we feel that we do get, are going to get a little restless and need to catch buses and things, if we would do it very respectfully. Thank you. And we'll start off with Sister Clark.
Hotev. Uh, sister Mims and members of the panel, brothers and sisters, I'd like to talk with you on the traditional African family as foundation of the African worldview and African development. And the purpose of this paper will be one, describe how the traditional African family function as foundation of our ancestors' worldview and of African development. And second, the theological or ontological authority by which the African family was formed and developed. Third, using the traditional African family as a paradigm, discuss how we African Americans can reconstitute and reconstruct our families as the sine quo non foundation for liberating and developing our communities at the local and national levels. When we speak of the African family, we are talking about essential characteristics of a social unit which nurtured and sustained its members as a unified group. The traditional extended kinship family included intergenerational family units, parents, grand and great grandparents and their children and children's children. The next larger family unit consisted of several extended families called clans. These clans came, claimed a common ancestor. Thus, the clans provided historical continuity and a strong sense of identity for all family members. Several clans formed a nation, and when several nations came together, they formed kingdoms or empires depending on the circumstances. Another essential characteristic of the extended family was the practice of self-reliance, which enabled each family to be self-sufficient. This was evidenced by the fact that each family was responsible for producing its basic needs, food, housing, clothing from the land. A family acquired products and services which it lacked through the medium of trade and exchange. Networking of families in the production and distribution of goods and services enabled families to exert powerful influence in the economic, social, and political life of the nation. Thus, in periods of national crisis, a self-evident commonplace uh, expression reminded the nation's leaders, quote, that the ruin of a nation begins in its homes. On the other hand, when all was well and peace and prosperity covered the land, the converse expression was applicable. The strength of a nation begins in its homes. Important to the inner stability of the African family was the African woman as mother and as, as her children's first teacher. She was an equal economic partner to her husband in that she helped provide food for her family, nurtured the family through pre preparing his meals. She was solicitous of the physical and emotional needs of her husband and children, and she was attentive to their health care. The traditional African family was mat matrifocal, that is, the wife and mother was the central focus of the family. Just as the African mother was responsible for teaching right, ethical, and moral behavior to her children, the African mother was the main link between two families. For when a man and woman married, it, was, it marked the uniting of two families rather than the mere coming together or union of two people in marriage. For it was expected that the wife would bear children, assuring the perpetuity of both families. The wife was a conduit also for inheritance, which passed through her to her, which passed through her to her brother's sons. Her brother, in return, protected his sister, and in the event of her husband's death, her brother provided for his sister's children. The brother protected his sister from abuse unless she committed adultery or some other horrible infraction of the society's rules. An African man could not abuse his wife. 
As we have seen, the African woman was held in high esteem. She was independent, could come and go without asking anyone's permission because the African woman safeguarded her independence by exercising her unerring sense of personal responsibility for her actions. It is quite apparent that the inherent organizational structure and function of the African family made the family the nation's most valued human resource and institution. In addition, undergirding the family and strengthening the family's unity was the practice of circumcision and excision. Upon reaching puberty, boys and girls were grouped separately in training camps away from their villages where they underwent rigorous training and tests in preparation for ritual initiation marking the death of their childhood. Those young people who passed these tests were resurrected, as it were, into their communities as men and women ready to enter into their new cycle as responsible adults, ready to assume their future responsibilities of marriage and parenting. Nothing was left to chance during the several months of rigorous training. In the case of the young girls, they were taught how to perform household chores, gardening skills, and especially how to prepare nutritious meals for their future husbands and children. They were taught how to respond to their husbands' physical and emotional needs, how to enhance their own feminine charms and graces as a means of heightening their self-image, which fosters self-confidence in a woman, especially when the knowledge of wifing is being transmitted by women who have been there. Instructions were given on when and where to make love, have sexual intercourse, what positions were permissible and which were not sanctioned by tradition. Boys were taught basic survival skills befitting a man. Here too, boys' self-image and manliness was assured through trial by ordeal. Testing their skills in calculations, hunting, learning their duties to their future wives and children as protectors and supporters, uh, providers. They learned how to defend their communities and or nations when necessary. The young people's rebirth was celebrated by the community, symbolizing that these young adults were released from their childhood cycle of depending on their biological parents for nurturing. They were reborn uh, as productive children of the community, ready to help shape the destinies of their communities and nations. Thus we see how age grouping cuts across all biological family ties, creating strong political and social bonding between men and women of each age group so strong that these group, group, age groups were prone to feel and act like brothers and sisters in response to their group interests and group needs. We may ask how Africans throughout the continent concurred on the idea of structuring a matrilinear family system which embraced the practice of circumcision and excision. Who was their source of authority? What were their basic assumptions? The late Czech Ante Diop provides a clue when he stated, the matriarchal system proper is characterized by the collaboration and harmonious, harmonious flowering of both sexes and by a certain preeminence of women in society due originally to economic conditions, but accepted and even defended by man. To say that men and women agreed on setting up a matrifocal family organization is true, but we need to search deeper for a bottom line response. Diop states that our Egyptian ancestors started with the concrete material conditions of their environment and then moved back in time to abstract an ontological or theological basis of authority for sanctions governing man's relationship to God 
and behavioral relationships between people and the relationship of man to nature. Diop says further that because the requirements of agricultural life, concepts such as matriarchy and totemism, the most perfect social organization, and monotheistic religion were born. <clears throat> He says further in describing the nature of uh, monotheism, circumcision resulted from monotheism. It was really the notion of a God, Amun, uncreated of all that exists and that led to the Adroninus concept. Since Amun was not created and since he is the origin of all creation, there was a time when Amun was alone. He must have contained within himself all male and female principles necessary for procreation. Belief in this hermaphroditic ontology would produce circumcision and excision in the black world, end of quote. So we see it was no accident that our forebears built our societal constructs on family relationships wherein the complementary equality between man and woman was acknowledged to be inherent in the very nature of creation and creativity. Hence equality of man and woman it originated, was created by God or ordained by God, Amun. There is only one creator God, Amun. Amun is both male and female. Therefore, circumcision of the male prepus, excision of the female clitoris, is sanctioned by our ancestors' perception of the androgynous nature of the one and only creator God. Using the human family as microcosm, the Egyptians intuited that Amun-Ra created a celestial family of gods and, and goddesses, both male and female, and endowed each with his, her uh, uh, respective characteristics and functions in nature. The function of the gods and goddesses have been described in great detail by scribes in Egyptian mythology. We know that this ontological basis for illegitimizing the structure of the African family spread throughout all black Africa, starting with the material requirements of the natural environment. And as Diop contends, one could go on to explain all the traits of the Negro soul and civilization by using the material conditions of the Nile Valley as a point of departure. The belief that God Amun Ra is both male and female translates into word at, or the principle of creativity. There was a void and then God spoke and creation process began. Africans such as the Dogons of West Africa never relinquished their perception of God as a drowning being. On, the base, on this basis, there can be no plant life, no biological life, or material phenomenon without a union of male-female essences. Even energies which are not seen by the naked eye, such as electricity, require the harmonious flow of negative electrons with positive protons. When we plug a lamp for light or an iron for heating, a ma male plug has to be hooked into a female socket. In, in, in the Judaic Christian tradition, by contrast, God is perceived as male only, giving rise in part to the patriarchal family structure. This view of a creator deity gives rise to irreconcilable dichotomies. 
it has taken the rise of speculative scientific skepticism in Western culture to resolve the dichotomy which characterizes Western myopic vision, East is East and West is West and ne'er the twain shall meet. While Egyptians use word to identify the beginning creation, they posited an all-encompassing universal ethical religious principle which celebrates man's ascendancy to civilization and self-awareness. This principle, mayat, means truth, righteousness, and justice. Truth, righteousness, and justice were with God, Amun, before anything was created. Mayat was in place before creation. The Egyptian tradition does not lend itself to an Adam and Eve myth, because in Egyptian mythology, our African forebears posited the concept of Mayat with full knowledge of plant reproduction, animal and human sexuality. Mayat appeals to our spiritual nature by requiring us to respect our sacrosanct and divine urge to recreate our own images generation after generation until the end of time. Mayat is an all-encompassing principle of governance upon which our Egyptian ancestors predicated all of their institutions, economic, social, political, with family as the primary institution. In the instruction of Ta-Hotep, as translated in the Husea, we are told, strive for excellence in all you do, so that no fault can be found in your character. For Mayat, the way of truth, justice, and righteousness is great. Its value is lasting, and it has remained unequaled and unchanged since the time of its creator. Although wickedness may gain wealth, wrongdoing has never brought its, uh, its uh, wares to a safe port. In the end, it is Mayat, the way of truth, justice, and righteousness that endures and enables the upright to say, it is the legacy of my father and mother. Early symptoms of the breakdown of order and balance, that is my yacht, in the collective life of the people occurs in the nation's homes. When Egypt underwent a severe social crisis in the, uh, in the first uh, intermediary period, Empur complained, as recorded in the Husea, lo, what the ancestors foretold has come to pass. The land is full of bandits and evil doers, and the plowsman, plowman goes to plow with his shield. Lo, the land turns like a potter's wheel. The robbers have become rich, and the honorable person a thief. The foreigners from without have come to Egypt, and the Egyptian of yesterday cannot be found anywhere. The great and small say, I wish I were dead. And little children say, he should not have caused me to live. And the unrestrained say, if I knew where God is, I would serve him. Today, following close on the heels of white America, the African-American family is in just such a crisis as described in the book of Empur. Our men and women are becoming strangers to each other. Too many of our children are begetting children without any prior knowledge or understanding of the responsibilities incumbent upon them in homemaking and parenting. They are further hampered by the fact that neither the boy nor girl have finished high school or acquired marketable skills. The generational pattern 
of children raising themselves in the street give us pause, for our future is dimmed by our increasing numbers of youth who are dispirited and frustrated with no hope. However, it is in times of crisis that we have our greatest opportunity to turn our conditions around. When people despair to the point where they cry out in anguish, if I knew where God is, I would serve him. In all of our beginnings, whether in West Africa, Central, South, or East Africa, our ancestors examined and used the material conditions of their environment as the basis for building institutions beginning with the family. To rescue and reconstruct our African-American family demands of us return to our African work, work ethic, namely, organize our human resources in such a manner that we work consciously for ourselves as an African community. Take, for example, the economic factor. If immigrants can come here from Europe, Middle East, and Asia, set up businesses in our neighborhoods, and keep profits out of our neighborhoods to invest in their communities, why can we not keep the profits in our neighborhoods by supporting businesses owned by individual African entrepreneurs and businesses owned by our people collectively in the form of co cooperatives? <laughs> Such a turnaround would provide the means to train and employ a number of our youth whose survival is dependent solely upon their street smarts. Sisters and brothers, we must re-examine our individual and collective lives through continuous study of our beginnings and implement the lessons we learned from our beginnings, starting with the first beginning, namely creation. We have learned from our readings, lectures, and discussions that the first and greatest civilization known to man was built by our Egyptian ancestors. Our studies further inform us that the creation principle, or the principle of creativity as intuited by our Egyptian ancestors, became the cornerstone upon which the first and greatest civilization known to man was founded. This universal principle, youth, truth, righteousness, justice, has withstood the test of time and will last throughout eternity. Therefore, it behooves us to renew our faith by internalizing Mayad as we reach out to touch the lives of brothers and sisters who in their striking out blindly and in darkness for answers maim and short circuit their own lives and the lives of us who are closest to them. In fact, we shall not rest, for only Amun Ra was satisfied after creation of the universe of complementary forces uh, harmonized by the divine law of Mayat, and he rested. Amun Ra permits us to develop to the limits of our capabilities, the ongoing creative building process within the sphere of human activity. The tremendous energies and smarts of our young must be challenged and channeled into creative purpose living. It is incumbent upon us to transmit to them the true knowledge about ourselves, teach them that we are social bodies social minds and spirits, two sides of the same coin, so to speak. Our awareness of our many levels of spirit depend upon the extent to which we explore our spiritual dimensions. It is through our minds and spirits that Mayad empowers us to harmonize and keep in balance our energies and achievements. Our young will come to know that where Mayat is, 
God is, and God is in us. The radical and rapid technological change is in our material circumstances, mass and jet transportation, satellite communications, nuclear energy, in no way dwarf our struggle for liberation of our minds and spirits. These material changes are the accumulative evolution of human effort and human intelligence. No single cultural group or ethnic group has a corner on human intelligence and energies. We laid the foundations for the development of Western civilization and technology. Using our collective human resources, we must rebuild humanizing institutions. Finally, at the height of the civil rights movement in 1966, Congressman Adam Clayton Powell rang a bell in his baccalaureate sermon at Howard University when he said, human rights are God-given. Civil rights are man-made. Our lives must be purpose to implement human rights. To demand these God-given rights is to seek black power, the power to build black institutions of splendid achievement. As we place our faith in Mayat as envisioned by our ancestors, we will again take our place center stage in world history by building and rebuilding even greater African institutions of splendid achievement beginning with the African family. Thank you.